All right, good morning everybody. We are set up for our second lecture on image processing retrieval and analysis. After we got all the administrative business out of our way, um, we can begin diving into the topic. First, however, as always, we ever so briefly uh, remind ourselves what we have been discussing last time already, when it was about content rather than about administrative and organizational matters. And, um, and then I will confront you with a sobering truth about image analysis. And uh, this is a great opportunity to once again point out the bigger picture of the uh, behind the whole lecture series. Uh, so to point out the uh, differences between what we have been doing in the last semester and what we're going to do in this semester. And as a first well, sort of gentle example of the kind of questions that will keep us busy in this semester, we will look into the problem of intensity quantization. In the last uh, lecture, uh, when I gave this, you know, ever so coarse overview over what we are going to do in this semester, I said that um, I will understand the idea of image analysis as a subset of methods which we usually uh, subsume in the area of computer vision and I already said that computer vision um, refers to the science and technology of machines that see uh, that is computer vision is concerned with the problem of um, developing theories and uh, techniques practical uh, applications practical approaches towards building artificial systems that are able to extract meaning out of images and when I say image uh, then, then you know that that also refers to videos because videos are just sequences of images so artificial systems or machines that are able to extract meaning or meaningful descriptions out of images and videos. Um, computer vision also refers to problems in the area of um, a depth perception and we do have two eyes and uh, those two eyes allow, the, allow us to you know, get ever so coarse an idea of how far things are away from our body. Um, this can of course be done uh, technically as well using cameras or Kinect sensors or whatsoever. Um, so extracting depth information, sort of the geometry of scenes from images or videos. Uh, but it also refers to computer vision, to the problem of extracting meaning uh, from yeah, more advanced sensing technologies, such as, for instance, fMRI sensors, which are used in medicine to scan um, our bodies internally and, and sort of assist doctors in diagnosing what kind of sicknesses or illnesses patients may have. But in this semester, we will uh, more or less focus on the problem of extracting meaning from a single image, uh, ever so coarsely from videos, but not look into um, 3D scene reconstruction and the like. And then there was this uh, extremely ugly diagram which I found on Wikipedia. So I mean like from, from an information visualization point of view. It is ugly, but it captures um, sort of the gist of my little speech here. Um, we see that these areas of computer vision, machine vision and image processing are tightly interlinked. They all have to do with the processing of digital images or video. Um, whereas uh, image processing you know, basically has to do with mm, transformations of the content of like pixel-wise content of images. Uh, computer vision has more to do with uh, fields like artificial intelligence or machine learning. And um, we'll look into that throughout this semester. So that, that is basically whereas in the last semester we were mainly concerned with signal processing and 
rather basic mathematics, we will now switch gears and consider problems in the area of artificial intelligence and machine learning. All right. And the obvious question you may ask is, is this any difficult? I mean, each and every one in this room can see, and we sort of do it naturally. Why, why would it be difficult to mm, implement this capability of being able to see on machines, on computers? For instance, we might be tempted to think that, you know, computers are good storage. Storage has become cheap. Computers are good in quickly sort of passing through large databases to search for stuff. And even if we don't know how the brain really accomplishes the feat of extracting meaning from all the signals that are incident to our eyes, uh, we have certain ideas, but you know, the details are still very much unknown to us. Um, even if we don't know how the brain does it, you know, we can sort of brute force it on a computer. Can't we just sort of record every picture that has ever been taken in a database and have somebody, you know, annotating them? This shows a uh, lecture scene. It's not a typical lecture hall, but used to be a conference hall. You know, somebody takes a picture of what I would be seeing right now and somebody else would have to write, uh, annotate the image with what can be seen in the image and then that would be stored in a database and then if a new image comes in we sort of just look for the image available in the database that is closest to the one we just recorded and transfer the labels from the one image to the other. Why, why not do that? Like if you know, hard drives have become cheap and our consumer cameras have uh, chips in them, memory chips that record terabytes of data these days. Why not, you know, record everything and, and look it up? Seems like the computerized way of doing this, right? It turns out that uh, this idea has actually um, been actively pursued recently. And by recently, I must say, uh, about five years ago. And <laughs> it never caught on, uh, even though we have you know, tremendous progress in storage uh, technology and, and um, database technology. Um, but from a theoretical point of view, this is really a stupid idea. And this is what I would want to point out to you. And to see this, let us consider the set of all intensity images of size 10 pixels by 10 pixels. But we're not talking about color images here, just intensity images. And in an intensity image we know that every pixel can have a value between 0 and 255, where 0 would indicate black and 255 would indicate white. So we're talking about gray values ranging from 0 to 255, black to white, one byte per pixel. And the spatial resolution of the images we are going to consider is 10 by 10. If you show such an image on your modern computer screen, it is hardly visible at all because the resolution of your screens is a couple of thousand by a couple of thousand pixels and 10 by 10 is at least two orders of magnitude smaller than the resolution of your screen. But well, let's look into those. So every possible 10 by 10 image, all right? And once again, just intensity and 10 by 10 is really, really small given modern standards. I already said that, that in such an image, every pixel assumes a value between 0 and 255, uh, 0 and 255, which is then to say that we do the math. There are 256, because 0 to 255, there are 256 numbers. There are 256 
raised to the 100, 10 by 10 is 100, possible such images. Okay? And uh, 256 raised to the 100 is about 6 times 10 raised to the power of 240. So this looks like a large number. So apparently there are many 10 by 10 images that are nothing but intensity images. So not, not color images, just intensity images. But there are a lot of them. Uh, one of these images will look like this. Every pixel has been set to zero. This is a 10 by 10 black image. Uh, some of them may look like this, sort of a smiley face. We can extract meaning out of that. Uh, some of them will look like this, noise. But, but each of these 100 pixels has an intensity value between 0 and 255. And then there's also this image, 10 by 10 pixels. All of the pixels have been set to 255. This is why. So what we see here is four examples out of the 6 times 10 to the 240 images of this kind. Okay. Now, let us consider this so-called Gedankenexperiment. A human being sees about 25 images per second. This is sort of the temporal frequency with which our brain processes stuff our eyes record. 25 images per second. Uh, right now there are about 7 billion people on earth. It's slightly underestimated but you know let's go with 7 billion people. So that is 7 times 10 to the 9 people on earth. A year has 350, 65 days times 24 hours times 60 minutes times 60 seconds. And if we put all this together, then a year has about 4 times 10 to the 7 seconds. Uh, here I'm, I'm slightly overestimating, but you know, we'll see that it doesn't matter. Humankind, uh, Homo sapiens, has a history of um, about 500,000 years, which again is rather generous. Is, is less than that, but let's say, you know, for the sake of the argument, 500,000 years. Now, we have to multiply the time humankind has been around in years, times the number of seconds that is, sort of times the number of humans, times the number of picture, uh, pictures all these people see per second. And that is to say, if we multiply all of this together, we find that 7 billion people who would have been around for 500,000 years, which of course they were not. And it's very recent that there are 7 billion people on this planet. But if they would have been around for 500,000 years, in the number they are right now, and they would have been active 24 hours a day, never slept, then all these people would have seen 3.5 times 10 raised to the 24 images of this kind. That is, if humankind had never slept and would have been around, and there would have been 7 billion people every day throughout the last 500,000 years, which of course all of this is bullshit, right? But even if that would have been so, then humankind has not seen all of the 10 by 10 images that are out there. Right? And in fact, this number of 10 to 24 is so ridiculously smaller than 10 to the 240. So that it appears that, you know, we can abandon all hope. Let's, let's get crazy and pretend that humankind would have been there since the birth of the universe. Now, the universe 
is about uh, 14 billion years old. Nobody knows for sure, but this is, is a good estimate. So 1.4 times 10 to the 10. Multiply that into the picture. All that does, all that does is raise the exponent from 24 to 28. Now what we actually want to reach is 240. And 10 to the 28 is still so much, so, so ridiculously much smaller than 10 to the 240. So even though 10 by 10 images are, you know, basically nothing on our modern screens, it's just, you know, a tiny speck. This Gedanken experiment shows us that we have not seen them all. It's impossible. There are more 10 by 10 images out there than humankind has seen to this date. Uh, it also basically tells us that it's very unlikely that all of them will have been generated. I don't know, you could probably do that on a uh, server farm, uh, have many computers generate them all, but why would anybody have ever done that? So I, I don't think that it has happened. It's very unlikely, very unlikely. This basically tells us that this idea of you know, treating um, the problem of image analysis, recognizing the content in an image as a retrieval problem, which is to say, store all the images in a database, annotate them, and then whenever a new image comes in, uh, look up for the, for the closest one, um, somehow is doomed to fail. Kind of work. Would, would have been nice, but uh, that's obviously not the way our brains do it. Right? That, that seems not physically possible to do it like that. And of course we know that our brains um, do it differently. We don't really know for sure how they do it, but we do know they do it differently. And uh, the question is, how, how close can we get to what the brain does? Indeed, uh, all of this looks very hopeless, but there is hope. Uh, why, after all, are we able to make sense of what we see? Right? If it is sort of like combinatorial, combinatorially impossible, uh, we would have to ask, well, but it seems practically feasible because we, we do it. Everybody in this room does it. We can see, we can extract meaning out of pictures. Why would that work if naively analyzed, it, it seems to be a problem of combinatorial explosion? Well, the reason is <coughs> that um, the vast majority of all these 10 by 10 images uh, do not make sense in the sense that they would show something which does not occur in nature. I don't know if, if this um, not could have been an image that I might have recorded somewhere. If I had a camera that would record 10 by 10 images, then you know, would have put it somewhere and taken an image. Um, maybe this is actually one, one of the images that would appear in nature. I really don't know. I don't know. But we can rest assured that the majority of these images in our Gedanken experiment uh, have no natural counterpart. They basically just show noise. And since we are biological beings living in a three dimensional physical world and having undergone, you know, uh, evolutionary optimization, our brains, like, you know, seen across the species, have learned to adapt to what is really out there and not to, to the stuff that is not out there. And mathematically, um, we can describe what is really out there in terms of the concept of a manifold. Now, unfortunately, I cannot illustrate 100 dimensional vectors on a 2D uh, plane. 
right? Um, so this, this is a matrix of 10 by 10 pixels, but we can think of it as a vector of 100 entries. Um, so all these images we have been considering are living in a 100 dimensional vector space. And sort of, you know, every, every image now is a point in that space. I cannot, you know, even imagine a 100 dimensional space, but I can imagine a three dimensional space. Right? So we have an X, Y, and a Z direction. And every image would be a point in that space. And, you know, if you really look at all of them, they would be very densely spaced in this space. But I said most of them, um, well, just show noise. So they are not of importance to our survival as a biological being. So our brain does not really have to be able to extract meaning from that. If we were aliens, maybe that would mean something to us. Who knows? Could be something, right? Yeah, it doesn't mean anything to us on Earth. But maybe to, to some other, if they are there, who knows? Could, could be that this means something. To us, it doesn't. I cannot plot all these things in a 100-dimensional vector space and I cannot show a manifold in 100 dimensions, but I can show a manifold in three dimensions. So this is just an illustration of what I want to hit home here. A manifold is the idea of a certain subset of points living in some high-dimensional space. Uh, this is a three-dimensional space. And this is some object, I don't know, some spirally thing embedded we say in this three-dimensional space. Um, and to describe the geometrical structure of this object here, we do not necessarily need um, three variables. If you, if you really think of it, uh, this is basically a two-dimensional object living in 3D, because, I don't know, all we need to know is sort of a, an angle, apparently around sort of the axis about which it is inclined. And we also just need the height with respect to the axis. So even though every point in this figure here lives in three dimensions, and if we would say this is each, each point here is a picture, a picture of three pixels, which doesn't make sense, but you know, for the sake of the argument, each of these points is a picture. So we would record them using three values but we really just need two values to describe them. At least to, to sort of get the gist here. It's so actually, now come to think of it, I should have drawn it differently because uh, let's not look under this rock. Here we still need three values. But anyway, anyway, you get the picture. The idea of a manifold is that it is an object in a very high dimensional space but it does not fill that space completely, but has some structure which uh, may need just fewer parameters to be described. And so therefore, the amount of information contained in a point living on a manifold is not the dimension of the embedding space. All right? And therefore, it seems that all the images that are out there in nature, everything we could ever record or imagine, because our brains can produce images, they can produce images that do not exist in nature, but we can do that. But everything that humankind has ever seen seems to live on a certain manifold. And the trick is then to identify those manifolds. For instance, if the problem was to, to recognize a person given a picture of a face, then each of these blue pixels here would represent the image of a face, and all the images of faces live in the vector space of the dimension of you know, their size, but they are not dense in that space. They form certain crazy subsets. And our problem is to identify those subsets and then maybe to look at how far a new image is away from this subset to say, oh, this is another face image or it is not. 
If it is a face image, we can sort of say uh, everybody around here is John Doe, and so this is a picture of John Doe. And I just said it, we have to identify those uh, <laughs> manifolds, right? And how do we do that? Well, um, typically we do this by means of examples. In this sense, every blue dot in this uh, figure here would be an example. And all these many examples would probably allow us to run a mathematical algorithm that is able to characterize uh, the gist, or the overall or general structure of this set living in 3D. In terms of, say, just a uh, 2D mathematical figure, whatever. And there you have it. When we do computer vision, we are dealing with the problem of trying to optimize something, trying to find the parameters of something that um, we can interpret. And with all of this, uh, this lengthy speech of mine, we can now contrast what we did in the last semester with what we are going to do in this semester. We have learned everything about transformations that is out there. And in that sense, image processing has to do with transformations. And from what I just sort of alluded to, can already deduce that image analysis is about optimization. And whereas um, yeah, transformations are easy, optimization is difficult. Why would I say that transformations are easy even if we you know, went through stuff like Fourier transform and Laplace transforms and stuff like that? Um, those are ideas that are incredibly well understood they are rather abstract, but once we have come to, to their foundations, they are easy concepts, and I try to, to hit that home. With respect to optimization, we are dealing with problems that may not necessarily be well posed, that may have um, many solutions or no solution at all. And um, there are very often different ways of obtaining the solution we are after. And the problem is to yeah, acquire enough knowledge to be able to recognize in which situation, which technique would yield the best solution or the best possible solution or what the best possible solution would be and how to get there. So this is, is way more, um, well, open in a sense that, you know, there's like, what I can do throughout this semester is I can expose you to ideas and I can somehow provide guidelines as to which idea to use when. But the question, what do I have to do in this situation? is illegal in this semester. Right? We are going to talk about stuff where this question cannot be answered. There, there are no clear-cut answers anymore. There are ideas as to what we can do, but um, this is different from, from um, I don't know, what we did in last semester. I said, let's, let's rotate the image by 30 degrees. There is one way and one way only how to do that. Right? But if we study in a second the idea of doing something with intensities in an image to improve <laughs> what the image shows uh, there are thousands of possible things we can do and it's a matter of experience to you know use the right one in that sense optimization is difficult but this is also why it is exciting you know, this, this is this is exciting uh, whereas everything that has to do with image processing is incredibly boring. And so therefore, I, I don't know why, but I have literally dozens of students who come to me and say, I want to do a master's thesis in image processing. And then I have to say, go home. There are no master thesis in image processing. Why not? Because it is only about transformations. And you basically should have 
learned everything about transformations in high school or your undergrad studies. It is not worthy a master's thesis to do something transformation. Right? This is it's just not, I don't know, unless it's about compression, but, but this is still somewhere in between. No, 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 there are no master thesis in image processing because image processing is incredibly well understood. Photoshop can do it for you. Why would you sort of replicate what Photoshop can do? Master theses are in the area of image analysis because there are open problems and they are exciting and you have to show that you have learned something, you know, sort of to, to tackle difficult problems, not the easy ones. That is the bigger picture. This is what we did in the last semester and now we'll sort of take it to the next level. Okay, um, in the very beginning of the last semester, we looked into um, how digital images are acquired using digital photography. Uh, we were not so much interested in images that result from using um, graphics programs, I don't know, um, Inkscape or stuff like that. Inkscape. Uh, we sort of focused on images that were recorded by digital cameras, and we saw that at the heart of a digital camera, there are these CCD chips, charge coupled devices semiconductor um, elements that are able to turn photon counts into um, charges. And schematically, we can think of such a CCD chip, which is responsible for recording the images in your camera as an array of yeah, these photosensitive devices. Um, and so therefore, this immediately translates to the idea of a Pixel matrix. And uh, since there's just a fine and large number, but finite number of pixels in, in modern images and cameras, uh, but it's, it's, it's finite. It's discrete. We can count them. We can say this is row one, uh, second element in row one. This is row three, third element in row three. So we have two indices to refer to the elements of such a picture or pixel matrix, but that is to say that they are discrete. This is it's, um, well, we can be continuous, but 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 the indices are actually uh, integer numbers. It's not like the uh, pipe element in the third row, but it's the third element in the third row. Right? Images are discrete, their domain is discrete. If we think of them as, as functions, they are discrete functions defined over a discrete spatial domain. And um, we also talked about the fact that, uh, again, just for the case of intensity images, um, the range is discrete as well. And we sort of talked about it again today when I said, you know, there are Pixels, each of the pixels indicates an intensity value. The intensity value is a number between typically 2 and 255, which translates into that each pixel corresponds to a byte. The amount of information stored in a pixel is a byte, which is 256 numbers, 2 to the 8 numbers. And it's basically to say that you know, there are uh, intensity levels. And if we talk about color images, then of course we would have sort of three color channels, but let's you know, not look under that rock, just talk about intensity images. So um, not only is the grid of pixels for which we have intensity images discrete, but also sort of the intensities themselves, they are discrete. Right? Of course there are, in this example, only 15, but basically infinite, but for all intents and purposes, basically infinitely many numbers of photons we could count on every CCD element. Um, but we just sort of want to represent very small numbers and very large numbers of photons hitting these semiconductor devices in terms of a number between 250, uh, two, uh, 0 and 255. We sort of have to uh, compress the whole range of all possible photon counts into a smaller range, in our case, this is just an illustration, should go to 255, but you know, can't, can't really draw that here. Um, so that is to say, the range is discrete too. 
And let me see if there is, yeah, okay. Um, and the beginning of last semester we said this, usually these two facts are summarized in the um, statement that digital images are digitized, the domain is discrete, and quantized, the range is discrete as well. And I said, I don't know, half a year ago, I, I, I don't know, it was half a year ago, um, we will not look into how this quantization is done, right? But just a few minutes ago, I said, mm, this semester is all about optimization. So now is the time where we look into how this quantization is being done, right? Um, because it provides us with a great opportunity to get an impression of what I mean when I say that image analysis is all about optimization. Okay. And those of you who know me know that whenever we do mathematics, I use the whiteboard. And I do that because it slows me down. Uh, it is better to, to do the math sort of using pen and paper than just to go through lots of slides. Next time we'll actually go through lots of slides, but that is really simple mathematics. So today, whenever you see this in front of you, you know, okay, he's doing stuff. Let's see. We are interested in the problem of intensity quantization. And um, that is basically to say we want to determine a function uh, that is called a quantizer, yeah, quantizer Q of X. Um, and you know, I'm you know just using mathematical notation here. It does not really probably should have called it Q of uh, I don't know I for intensity. But dx in our case is supposed to refer to um, well, either photon counts on a CCD element or we can already think of it as in terms of an electric charge. We talked about how these photon counts are turned into charges. dx is basically what the chip records and we are interested in a function q that turns this recording into numbers between 0 and 255. And we will, you know, just look at a very, very simple approach to this. Again, just as an example of what it means to do optimization. Let us assume that this function Q of X is piecewise constant piecewise constant. And one way of expressing this mathematically is to say that Q of X assumes a value of VI for all X um, such that, I don't know, AI is less or equal than X is less or equal than A I plus one. Can uh, picture this as follows. Uh, here is the um, domain we're talking about, x, something for all intents and purposes uh, continuous. And um, when I say this piecewise constant, we are interested in a function that probably looks like so. I don't know, I you know, not talking about that function in, in detail, but uh, all we need to know that it is a step function in the sense that um, 
say this one here is, let's call it A1, and this one is A2, and this one is A3, and here is A4, and so on and so forth, right? And here we would have B1, this is B2, here is B3, and so on and so forth, right? So if X is in between A1 and A3, it assumes a value of B2. And it does so for every value between A2 and A3. It is piecewise constant. Okay? Um, another way of picturing this is, let me switch color. Um, I don't know. Say, again, this is X, the domain we are talking about. We have somewhat determined a minimal value for the x and somehow a maximal value for the x. And it, it seems to be a good idea to set the first interval boundary a1 to be minimum value of x and uh, well the second interval boundary is somewhere and then we sort of say uh, some point inside that interval corresponds to the, to the value we actually sort of want to assign to every point in that interval. Uh, this, this is a 2D representation of this idea. This is actually a 1D representation. Um, say then we have A3 here, and this would be B2, and then all the way to what do I have here? Some A capital L. I don't know why I choose capital L. You know, I did it years ago capital L, and this last thing here is called A capital L plus 1, and in between there is some value we call B capital L. So this is another picture of uh, what we want to achieve. We are given some interval. We sort of want to quantize that interval, that is, determine, you know, sub-intervals and for each of these sub-intervals, we want to determine a representative number. All right? And I prefer this picture over the one I just erased. Um, now, the next question we, we should ask is, well, what, what about this L? How do we, where does it come from? Optimization is a craft rather than a science. Nobody knows. You have to choose it. How do you choose it? Nobody knows. There are guidelines or there's experience. And typically, for the purpose we are after here in this context, typically um, we choose, choose the number, number of quantization levels, quantization levels, I, now I see why it's called capital L, <laughs> levels, well, how to choose it, right? such that we choose it such that, such that um, it has a power of 2, L equals 2 raised to some B. For instance, for instance, L could be 2 to the 8, that would be 256 different levels. Right? This, this is what happens in our computers. Okay, now we have fixed capital L, the rest is all our variables. Uh, how to determine those? A1, uh, A, so A1 is fixed, should be sort of like the minimum we ever expect. Um, AL plus 1 is fixed, is the maximum we ever expect. Um, but then there is A2, A3, all the way to AL, and B1, B2, all the way to B. How to choose those numbers? How to choose those parameters of our function Q? And it's an optimization problem in a sense. And B 
if it is an optimization problem, we will very often formulize it as follows. We consider our continuing ref because it appears that this one uh, is, is more readable than the left one. We consider, so the fact that I continue in red has no semantic meaning whatsoever, it's just for readability, uh, a quantization error. Quantization error. And um, that is to say that we will consider a function that tells us well, if we are given all these um, recorded intensities, all the intensities recorded in a certain picture by the CCD chip, and we now represent them brutally in terms of uh, just a few numbers, and, and every number that is not exactly one of these numbers B we are going to choose, like every intensity, will be sort of you know, represented by the closest number B. And this will, of course, introduce some, some error because some of the intensities we have recorded will now be represented by a different number. And we can ask, well, how, how large is the error we introduce this way? Right? If we sort of are given something and represent all these things in terms of just a few other things, we will make mistakes. So there will be differences between the original number and the number we chose to represent it. Overall, how large is this mistake? Um, and that is to say, well, yeah, there is, there's some error, we call it the quantization error. And now, again, there is thousands of possible um, ways of formalizing this idea of looking at the mistakes we make. So what do we do? Yeah. I just choose it to be the mean squared error, mean squared error, often goes by the name MSE, between um, the intensity we recorded X and the quantized intensity Q of X we assign to it. Right. And I can write it down like this. So error is typically, I'll do it like this, I don't know, but from now on I'll actually, whenever you, you see a capital E, it's an error, error function, right? <laughs> okay, mean squared error, what could that possibly mean? Let's go for it. Um, I'll formulize it as the integral from x min to x max. And then we have a squared error, so that is qx minus q of x squared. And then um, I'll introduce a function I'll call p of x, which I understand to be the density of the axis. And all of this is being integrated with respect to x. Maybe so briefly, what is the density of axis? Here is uh, sort of the, the, the real line along which we record photon counts. There will hardly ever be a photon count less than zero, but probably we'll have lots of CCD elements so that record stuff like here, and then lots of CCD elements that record stuff like there. So we see in the image we just recorded, there are apparently uh, rather many dark pixels because we have lots of sort of intensities that are not so large. And then there's rather many bright pixels because there's somewhat a lot of densities that are rather large, but in between there are not so many. So this is sort of what I mean by density. Right. We'll talk about this in more detail next time. So Px sort of indicates the density we observe here. Now, um, well, this, this, is just, this is just the idea. Now let's fill it with uh, content, bring it to life. So, I don't know, this is magic. This is, I just said, you know, 
let's consider the quantization error and let's assume that the quantization error is a mean squared error and uh, know that I never use multiplicative constants. If, if I can drop, then I do. There should be a constant here, but it's gone. It's somewhat contained in here, so don't worry. This is a mean uh, squared error. Um, why? Honestly, nobody knows. Basically, because everybody doesn't like this. That's that's the answer here, right? But still, looks looks very abstract. Let's let's fill it with life, because some of the things we know here, uh, some of the things in here, we have already better expressions for. So basically, um, first of all, we agree to consider this in terms of um, quantization level. And um, that is to say that we can express this integral in terms of a sum over quantization levels. And um, each of these quantization levels now will be represented as an integral, which ranges from ai to ai plus 1. And, uh, well, let's look at the squared error here. We have x. And we just said that q of x is supposed to be e i. So we plug it in here, e i. That has to be squared times p of x dx. Right? Can you see that? So we said the, the error is sort of given by this integral over the whole domain we are talking about. But we already also said that we subdivide the whole domain into smaller subdomains, the subintervals. This is what I have done here. But we not only do this once, but L times. So all of this can be sort of expressed like this. And instead of Q of X, I write BI, because we said that if X is between AI and AI plus one, then Q of X should be BI. This is what I did here, right? Okay, uh, now here's a dirty trick. Um, this, this is really, this is <laughs> uh, <laughs> just for you to see the level of mumbo jumbo we are going to do in this semester. I will write this as the sum where i ranges from 1 up to l, and then the integral from ai to ai plus 1 over some function fi of x dx. Mm. Why would I do this? I mean, you know, <laughs> we know how this fi of x has to look like. Like this. Right? This, this, is, this is just a substitution, apparently, because not much has happened. But why would I do that? Because if we look at this, we know that it can be written like so. Uh, some where i ranges from 1 up to l, and now a capital F of i at ai plus 1 minus capital F i of ai. I just pretend that I could evaluate this integral. Right? And we do know that uh, if we want to compute a definite integral like this over some function fi, it is basically the empty derivative, capital Fi, evaluated at the upper bound of the integral, minus the antiderivative f of a, uh, fi of a, evaluated at the lower bound. All right? So this is, you know, what, what can I say? It's just a trick, and and uh, at this point we cannot yet see why tricks like these make sense, but we'll see it in a minute. And um, it already goes to show that you know everything I am doing here is reasonable. I can explain why I'm doing this, um, but I cannot explain why I got the idea of doing that. Because that is basically experience. And 
again, this goes to show that when it comes to optimization, there are recipes, mathematical recipes, that is, or algorithms for how to approach certain problems. But then again, there's also a lot of experience in there. It is more open in the sense than the, uh, in a sense, than the techniques we studied in the last semester. It, it is, you know, why would we choose this? Everybody does it. Is there a better answer than that? Yeah, there are statistically, those are good ideas, but there are even better ones. But then it turns out this, this one is a good compromise between a good idea and, and an efficient idea. The better ones are more nasty to deal with. So this is, you know, everybody does it because it's nice. Um, yeah, this is no problem here. This is just basically formalizing what we talked about. This is, this is just mumbo jumbo. And that mumbo jumbo is just there because it simplifies the next step. So without further ado, let's go for it. I would not have needed to do this, but it simplifies all the stuff I have to write down. Um, now we are given this error function and we have written it in terms of a sum over differences between antiderivatives evaluated at certain points. And in the last, last line I just erased there was no bi anymore. Right? All the, the variables were ais. bi was, was gone from, from that uh, formulation. Now how do we determine those ai? Again, requires experience and it requires the gut to say, let us assume the bi were given. They, of course they are not, but you know, let us assume they were given. So, assume the bi are given, given, then we can do the following. We can consider the partial derivatives of our error function with respect to the parameters this function contains. And in the last line I erased the only parameters were these um, sort of places of the boundaries of these intervals ai. Um, and if we do this, then this amounts to dbai sum over um, now I'm plugging in J here. This is because well, I'm choosing the I here. I should have put in, done it the other way around. It doesn't matter. It's just notation, right? This, this, it was a sum over I previously. Now it's a sum over J, but this is just I should not have done it like this. But you get the picture anyway, right? Um, at J at A J plus one minus F J at A J. First thing we note that a lot of terms in this sum here do not depend on AI. Right? And uh, let me let me just write it in one, one more step in between a lot of stuff. Plus, and then we have F I minus one evaluated at AI minus F I minus one evaluated at A I minus one plus fi evaluate ai plus 1 minus fi evaluate at ai plus lots of stuff. Now those are the only four terms in this sum where the ai appears. And uh, <laughs> yeah, well, well then let's, let's just compute this. Uh, first of all, we are deriving with respect to ai. This thing here does not depend on AI. This thing does not depend. The only two that depend on AI are these two. Right? So this is <laughs> um, FI minus one prime is the first one. AI minus FI prime of AI. Um, now I'm reversing the trick. This is, you know, I could have 
had lots of integrals here, but then I would have had to write a lot. And so this is just, it was a trick to, to simplify my life as the guy who has to write all this. But we do know that the derivative of fi minus one is lowercase fi minus one, fi minus one ai minus lowercase fi of ai. Ah, no big deal here. And now I will um, sort of substitute, uh, back substitute everything which we defined to be fi. Uh, that is to say here we have ai minus bi minus 1 uh, squared times p of ai. That is this here right? and this. And this guy is ai minus bi squared times p of ai. All right? No big deal. Now, and the reason why we like to um, derive the error function with respect to the parameters we need to determine is that we know that if we look at the first derivative, and the first derivative assumes a value of zero of a function, then that is either a maximum or a minimum of that function, right? And of course, we would need to be very careful. Um, in our case, we want to make the error as small as possible. So we want to find parameters ai that would minimize this error function. We would have to make sure that if we equate all this to zero, uh, then that is really a minimum rather than a maximum. Um, I, I am not, I'm sort of skipping the step where at this point I, I require this to be zero because if it is zero then it's either a maximum or a minimum of the error function. I would have to verify if it really is a maximum or a minimum of the error function but you know I don't do this. I just phew, sort of naively carry this ahead. All right. Generally you would have to do it, I'm not going to do it. Now we have developed this here. We um, are looking at the error function and its first derivative with respect to one of the parameters and we call it ai. We end up with a certain expression which we require to be zero. Right? So then let's um, rearrange everything we have found so far. Basically to say I can immediately divide away the uh, p of ai, right? On the right hand side there was a zero uh, and this factor p of ai occurred in both terms on the left hand side. I divide by p of ai, it goes away from the left hand side. If I divide zero by some, it's not there. So p of ai is gone. So therefore, um, continuing what I just erased, we find that ai minus bi minus 1 squared has to equal ai minus bi squared. Right. This, this is just algebra. Um, I said that we do assume that we would know the values of the bi's. So these are not variables at this point in time, but they are something we know. But then it's basically to say that we can indeed solve this for AI. Like there is sort of just one unknown here and we can easily solve this. It's indeed um, a quadratic equation. So um, there are two solutions, right? If we really were to go through uh, how to solve this for AI, we would realize there are two solutions, but only one of them makes sense because um, here we are dealing with, with um, a problem where the solution should not be negative right? because there's no negative sort of photocounts. 
Um, so this has two solutions. Um, two solutions. Um, only uh, one of which, one of which, sort of makes sense uh, from a physical point of view. And again, this is something I know from experience. Like if I if I had no experience, I would have to consider both solutions, but I don't because you know, I've done it thousands of times. So let's um, write it down. How, how do we get the solution that makes sense? Basically, looking at that, we first take the square root of both sides, is to say that we can express this as ai minus i minus one is the same, <laughs> I can do the trick here, <laughs> minus ai minus bi. Well, um, yeah, so here is the solution that makes sense, right? I said, let's take the square root of both sides. Um, uh, the, this, the fact that I have a minus here uh, is, is owing to the fact that I know that only this solution makes sense, mm -hmm. okay? But you know, if I square this, minus goes away. But I know that, you know, if that was not there, would be another solution, but I'm not interested in that one. But, um, this then is the same. We, we, we add AI on one side, uh, on both sides we get two AI, and um, here we have um, BI plus BI minus one, and now we just divide all of this by two. So we have found our solution BI plus BI plus one divided by two. That is to say, um, we have indeed solved our problem which was when we assume that the BIs are given, um, we want to determine the optimal choice for the AIs. Right? And it appears that if those uh, BIs are given, then each of the AIs are sort of exactly in between any two BIs. So that is to say that the interval boundaries boundaries of this quantization function ai are in between in between uh, the quantization points um, quantization points vi okay now um, I said, let us assume that those bi were given. Now, in practice, they are of course not given. All right? Um, but I could have also said, let us assume the ai were given and solve our problem for the bi. Of course, in practice, the ai are not given, but magically we have now derived an expression for the AI. And as it so happens, this expression actually only depends on the BI. And now I can confidently say, let us assume the AI are given. Right. And we now go through this whole exercise again with respect to the BI. And then we will find a solution that uh, maybe to some of you is actually already known. Okay, let, let, me, let me start a, a survey. Who, who knows <laughs> the solution this will end up with? Okay, not yet, but maybe once we have it, you'll, you'll recognize it. Um, okay, so let's now repeat all this, but assume that the AI are given, are given. Well, then we, you know, do the same uh, you consider the same procedure. We look at the derivative of the error objective function, error or objective function, uh, with respect to the variables bi. So that is b b bi. And now I am writing the error function uh, again, like, like you know, in the form that involves the bi. Mj, mj plus. 
plus 1, x minus dj squared p of x dx. Right? Um, awesome. Okay, so first of all, again, like uh, we now are dealing with the problem of trying to determine those parameters bi of our quantization function q. And our idea is again to consider the derivative of the error function with respect to all of the parameters, but we, we just write down the mathematics for just one of them. And um, here I just sort of back substituted what E really means. E is this sum where J ranges from one up to L, and then in each term of the sum we have an integral from AJ to AJ plus one, X minus BJ squared times P of X integrated with respect to X, right? Now, not every term in this sum depends on bi, right? So we immediately see that we can write this as the integral from ai to ai plus one, and then partial derivative with respect to bi of x minus bi squared p of x dx. Does that make sense? It does, right? We have a sum over lots of j's, but only when this j is the same as this i, this actually evaluates to something less than zero. So instead of all these terms in the sum here, we, we basically end up with just this integral. For the case where the j, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, eight is i in our current case. Right? When, when j is equal to i, only then is this different from zero. So all of this, the different partial derivative of this sum goes uh, to this expression here. Ah, that gives us an easy integral here. Um, let's, let's go for it. Um, well, yeah, okay, so it is not that easy, but at least we can, we can, um, ah, it's that easy actually. What, what am I talking about? Um, we have to compute the partial derivative of this thing with respect to bi, and this is easy. The integral is not easy, but the partial derivative is easy. This is just minus, and I just write it down, minus two ai integral ranging from ai to ai plus one, and then x minus bi times p of x dx. I guess you can't agree on that, like uh, the two comes from the outer derivative, this goes down, and the minus one comes from the inner derivative, so there's no problem here. So minus, minus two times this integral. And um, again, we require that all of this evaluates to zero because if it does, then we can rest assured that it's either a minimum or a maximum of the error function. Again, we do not verify if it is a maximum or a minimum, we just pretend it was a minimum. Now we have this and we will continue just as we did earlier. What I just erased uh, involved, uh, again, first of all, I can immediately divide away this minus two, right? I can divide the left-hand side by minus two, the right-hand side was zero, I divide it by minus two, doesn't make, make any difference. Then we had an integral involving x minus bi times px. You can write this as x times px minus bi times px, right? And then we can actually rearrange everything, so I will do that. Um, what I just erased, erased is the same as saying that the integral from ai to ai plus one over x p of x integrated with respect to dx is the same as the integral from ai, AI to ai plus one b times p of x dx. Now, this again, uh, bi, I, what I don't know where bi comes from. bi 
Uh, this is easy to solve for BI. Let me just do it. Let's say that BI, this integral, does not depend on BI. We can plug it out, pull it out, um, and then divide by uh, this goes to the power integral from AI to AI plus one x times P of x dx divided by the integral ai to ai plus 1 p of x dx. Now, have you seen this before? Something like Yeah, um, that is a good good area where you may have seen this. I said that this P of X is a density. Let's assume it's a density. Then what is this? Lepidus. What? Lepidus. Exactly. Very good. Excellent. This is a mean. Right? And it is indeed not the overall mean of all the intensity values x we have, but it is the mean of the intensity values in the integral from a, ai to ai plus one. Right? And that tells us, very good, um, that those quantization points, quantization points, uh, bi we are after, are the means of the x in the quantization in the quantization intervals intervals a i to a i plus one. There you have it. There's a couple of more things. I have some time left, so I can I can continue babbling about this. We have now found a solution to the quantization problem, where we said, okay, we are given many many intensity values recorded by a CCD chip, and um, we want to represent all these intensity in terms of just say 256 numbers and the question is how to do that and one idea is to say okay every intensity from here to there goes to a certain number every intensity from here to there goes to another one every from here to there and then from here to there so this is we first sort of determine intervals for our intensities and once we have these intervals, we say, okay, so what is the best choice to represent all the intensities? What, what is the best number to represent all the intensities within one interval? Well, it's, it's the mean. Or as you said, it's actually a weighted mean, or it's, it's the mean with respect to this interval. Um, and there we go. This is, of course, overkill no digital camera camera does it that way right. what, what they do is when they produce these things um, they have lots of pictures under lots of different lighting conditions and they know the physical properties of their chips and blah 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 so they determine these quantization functions during production and then sort of burn it onto the chip so this is not computed online but it's it's done once and once it is done they have a lookup table in this camera and but, but these things are really done with respect to the physical specifications of the chip. So, you know, it makes sense, it makes sense. That was the first thing I wanted to say. Um, the second thing I wanted to say is, well, you know, I said, let us assume the BI were given and then find the AI. And we were able to find an expression for the AI if we assumed that the BI were given. 
And then I said, now let us assume the AI we're giving, which at that point was true. Uh, let us find an expression for the, yeah, that was somewhat circular, right? Um, now that we have found it, we can, but where to start? When, you know, at the very beginning, we don't know the BIs. If we want to do something like this in practice, then we sort of have to start somewhere. And a good idea is to somehow choose those L, B1, B2, to live all the way to BL numbers somewhat randomly. Initialize the L values for the BIs and then compute the AI and then compute the BI. Maybe with this new BI, you will get new AIs. So maybe we do it another time, compute the AI given the new BI. Now we have new AI, maybe then, you know, compute new BI. And if we're lucky, this process will eventually converge in the sense that um, neither the AI nor the BI change in one of these iterations. Have you ever seen such a process before in, in, in practice, like in your studies? You initialize something, you compute something, you compute something else. Given what you just computed, you update the first stuff, and then you update the second stuff, and you update the third. Have you seen that before? Excellent. Where else? Yeah, I was just after k-means. I was just after k-means. But yeah, k-means. Now, uh, you said k-means, and you also said that this is what? an invariant. And think of it, in k-means we sort of compute these things and then every point that is closest to the mean is assigned to a cluster. Here we don't have sort of clusters but intervals. And everything that is in this interval is likely closer to the mean than to the mean in the next interval. right? Not, not really true but you know Somehow it indeed is. Actually, we said that the boundaries of the intervals are exactly at the middle midpoints between the. So, this is what? This k means clustering. Okay, can you see that? You know, we, we first initialize uh, the means, then we compute the clusters, which in our case are expressed in terms of interval boundaries. Given these intervals, we have to sort of readjust the means. Having readjust the means, we need to readjust the interval boundaries and iterate this until hopefully nothing will change anymore. So there you have it. This is just k-means clustering. Um, it is k-means clustering using cutness. All right. But um, and and the, the algorithm we just went through is, is called the uh, Lloyd-Max algorithm. Um, and it's called the Lloyd-Max algorithm because this is done with respect to um, continuous values of x and not sort of discrete sets of, of points or vectors. But if you know k-means clustering, then you should understand this. And the only difference in what we did here in comparison to k-means is that, yeah, we had integrals and integration uh, and derivatives, but turns out this is k-means in disguise. Hmm, okay, um, and the third thing I wanted to say is, already in our second lecture we have therefore seen an optimization procedure. Right. And already in our second lecture, we have therefore seen that, um, well, in a rough sense, and this was just about sort of like how to determine a good quantization function for, for, for images, for a camera. Um, but now that we have agreed upon that this is just a variant of the k-means algorithm, we have already seen that Apparently, what we are doing in this semester involves stuff that is more AI than, than sort of just sort of yeah, transformator signal processing. Right? K-means 
is, is something you may know from, I don't know, courses you've taken in machine learning or uh, artificial intelligence, but likely not from a course on image processing, I don't know. So you see that what we are after here has more to do with um, AI methods which typically have to do with optimization and that leads me to the fourth and final point I wanted to make. Um, early on today I said that you know this, this is basically a matter of experience, uh, it's, it's not so much a science, uh, using these kind of things is, is you know it involves science, but in the end it's rather a craft than a science. And we can see this here as well. I, I'm done in a second. We can see this here as well. Um, everything we did is mass mathematically precise and concise. But it crucially hinges on the assumption that the BI are known when we start all this. Right? And so I just said, you know, in practice we randomly initialize them. And that works well, but we have no guarantee that it works perfectly. There's no, no guarantee for that, even for simple problems like this. So it looks, looks you know, very precise, concise and reasonable mathematically, but still it hinges on, on, on random, random factors. And therefore, um, all of what we're going to do in this semester really makes sense but you must be careful and not believe that it always perfectly solves everything you want to solve. Right. And final comment is that um, you will have to do this in the first um, uh, project and you can actually, uh, like once you have implemented all this, see what happens if you use different initializations and if the result will always be the same or not. Likely with the, with the uh, examples I provide, very likely to be at least very similar all the times, but still I would expect to see that you'll find differences depending on your initialization. So that is all I have got for today. Do you have any questions? Great, then we see each other again on Thursday. Thank you.